afternoon, everyone. I am so happy to see such a good turnout tonight, today. Um, as most of you know already, I'm Tonda Phillips, and I'm the chairperson for the Public Policy Committee of the Greater Mount Airy Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the staff and the board of directors, uh, I want to welcome you all to another installment of the Chamber Lecture Series. My name is Chris Lumsden. I serve as the Chief Executive Officer and President of Northern Regional Hospital, and I have the distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our special guest speaker. So we have a great man in the legislature, and as we all know, he is running for Lieutenant Governor of the great state of North Carolina. So it's my honor and my privilege to introduce and to wel welcome Representative Jeffrey Elmore and our future Lieutenant Governor for the state of North Carolina. I appreciate that. I need to just say thank you and sit down, right? But um, I am Representative Elmore and I represent the 94th. I'm from North Wilkesboro, uh, home of the North Wilkesboro Speedway. And uh, we grow our corn in jars uh, up my way. And I'm glad that Andy and Barney are from Mount Airy and not North Wilkesboro. We couldn't do our activities like we have for years up my way. But um, anyway, it's uh, good to be with you to share a little bit today on the work of the General Assembly to try to build a better business climate for North Carolina. And I appreciate my colleague, Sarah Stevens, being here. Uh, we work very well together and I'm um, happy that she came uh, to hear me say a few words. With uh, what Chris was talking about, there's so many factors that go into the business climate uh, across the state, and we have different problems across the state and different solutions to those problems um, because they're varied. Uh, we basically do have two North Carolinas right now. We have a rural North Carolina and a very fast-growing urban centers coming out of Charlotte and Wake and it presents two very different problems and people have different opinions on how to approach it but I feel like the work that we've done uh, at the General Assembly especially with our budgetary uh, choices is we've tried to target the problems are we where we need to be no because we can always do better you folks are business folks here it, you, you know, you can push it to the next level always. Uh, we've been named two years in a row by CNBC as the number one state for business. And we scored well on all factors. And that's a big accomplishment because it's very rare that states get named number one back to back. And um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what has, um, I believe, caused that and what we need to do moving forward. First, uh, we targeted our tax policy. And when I first got to the General Assembly, we were in massive debt to the federal government with unemployment insurance. Uh, we were also running deficits in the uh, state budget. I've taught school for 23 years, so I lived through pay freezes. I, I don't know if some of the younger teachers uh, remember that, but uh, I was told I was supposed to be paid at a certain level, but for five years it just stayed at the exact same level. But I was promised this loose hope of, yes, uh, you, you'll get to that someday. So uh, when, the, uh, when we took over, uh, one thing that we pride ourselves in, the biggest pay raise I actually got as a teacher was when we unfroze the scale. And we just put teachers where they were supposed to be on the scale. So all of a sudden I gained five years of backlog on uh, salary. But uh, we, we really had a tough time uh, getting it balanced. Uh, we had to do uh, about $4 billion worth of cuts to the state budget uh, to get it balanced and moving forward. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure that business is growing in the state. So we started a uh, tax philosophy of trying to lower the income tax as low as we possibly can, also lowering the corporate tax to generate growth. And uh, we have been taking steps towards that over the uh, past 10 years. Part of this current budget, and I brought my sheet just so I didn't want to give the wrong numbers. I forgot who I talked to this morning. I was talking about stats. and. You don't want to give the wrong stat because somebody will say, well, you said 20 and it's really 18.9. But uh, we, we're cutting taxes in this budget by 1.2 billion for family and businesses over the next two years. Uh, we are accelerating our reduction plan to the income tax rate will drop down to 3.99 in 2026. 
We also authorize additional income tax reductions to 2.49% if revenue targets are met. Uh, that's basically a check that we put in, and this is something that the House put forth. We don't want to, on this side of the sheet, actually cut the taxes to the point that you create financial problems for the state. So we put in there triggers. So if our revenues hit certain numbers, it will trigger the additional tax cut. If it doesn't meet those numbers, uh, that tax cut will not take place at that time. It will be deferred down the road. And this is to protect you because, when, like I said, when we took over, these state budgets were doing this number. It was feast or famine. There were tons of money. They sent it out the door. Then when there was no money, they still wanted to spend money, but they didn't have it. So this stabilizes all of that. Uh, something interesting for you guys, we capped the franchise business tax pay on the first uh, one million, and we eliminate the state privilege license tax on professionals. Uh, that was a very strange tax where it's basically, you have the privilege of existing in North Carolina, please give us money. Uh, that was a tax that really folks just uh, felt like it was not fair to pay. Uh, so a consistent tax policy does and has helped spur the growth. Um, we tried doing that across the board. It's a different philosophy than in the past where it's massive uh, tax incentive packages going to certain companies. We're trying to not, as much as we can, not have winners and losers. So the tax policy is critical. Also targeted economic development is critical. Uh, I think this is something with rural North Carolina. You've got good things going on here in Mount Airy. You should be very proud of yourself. You're very much ahead of the curve in comparison to other parts of the state. And you're sitting here thinking, well, what do you mean? Because we've got to do this and this and this and this. You have a very diverse economy here. And, and many of our communities do not have that, especially in eastern North Carolina. Uh, we're talking about uh, basic farm communities where they don't really have a processing facility or anything of that nature in the area. It is pure uh, farming. Um, row crops many times. Uh, Jones County, for example, one cent on their tax rate would only generate $40,000 for the county because their tax base was so low. So here in Mount Airy, where I got to tour today, the downtown, you have a growing tourism sector. You also have a manufacturing sector. Uh, you have a blended economy. So if something gets weak, economy downturn, and you do lose some tourism dollars, you have other industries that are propping it up. That d diverse economy is critical, and part of that is the hospital. Um, Chris was talking about the role that it plays, not only as an employer, but the role that your hospital plays in attracting new employers. Um, I deal with one of my counties, Taylorsville, had a hospital that closed, and now they're in a situation where they do not have a emergency access of any nature in their county. So if their EMS is having to take a person to the Statesville Hospital and the Statesville Hospital is at capacity, they may have to reroute them to another hospital. They may have to send them to Wilkes or even Hickory. In that scenario, it changes that ambulance ride from a 25 minute ride to possibly an hour and a half uh, for that person. And you can have a person with cardiac issues, things of that nature. Industries look at that, so when they're looking at placing, that medical piece is critical. Uh, they um, do not find areas that do not have proper medical care um, attractive. And this problem is all over the state. Um, my wife was talking about the um, hospital in Martin County, which is very rural, and some decisions were made about their hospital. and. Um, because those decisions were made, the company that bought the hospital actually liquidated all assets and the hospital was closed in a two year period with a uh, very limited opportunity for it to open back up. So you are doing great things with your hospital here in Mount Airy and it is a true economic driver and it's a foundation piece that's going to help you economically in the future. But targeted economic development can take different forms. Uh, I was very excited about the reopening of the North Wilkesboro Speedway. Uh, it is an exciting thing for the entire region. 
I remember meeting a delegation from Mount Erie and they were talking about their convention center and they came in my office and they said we're very excited about the racetrack and um, they said that is helping us make the decision if we move forward with our convention center because the role that that piece of economic development plays regionally yes it's great for North Wilkesboro and it's got my name on it but it's affecting all of Northwest North Carolina uh, we invested 18 million dollars in that did an economic incentive for the all-star race so we've invested about 22 million dollars from the state level but the estimates show that just from the one week of racing uh, the all-star race in May that it generated over 50 million dollars worth of economic activity in the region uh, my colleagues from Forsyth County came and said when's the next race and I said, why, uh, Senator Lowe, why are you, are you excited? He said, you filled every hotel room in Forsyth County for days. Uh, the hotel rooms were filled in the entire region, which helps everybody. So targeted economic development for rural areas is critical. But you have to leverage the, the assets that you have. Um, I'll use Bladen County as an example, not picking on my friend, Representative Brisson, but a microchip factory is not going to place in Bladen County. That's just the reality of it. But what assets do they have there that you can leverage to help them grow? Well, that's the agriculture sector. So we've put money in the budget that deals with um, what is called further processing. What further processing is, is a real simple concept. Um, you may be a maker of sweet potato french fries and you flash freeze them and package them for Harris Teeter. Well, why don't you place that factory where the bulk of the sweet potatoes are grown? And what that does is not only help the economic base tax-wise for these county commissioners that are in here, but it stabilizes the farmers that are in that surrounding area. So they have a guaranteed buyer for their product and it makes sure that these family farms stay open. Targeted economic development works. Um, your assets here, you do a good job of le leveraging them. Um, the Andy Griffin, the, the idea of Mayberry, the leveraging your history, your historical buildings. You are using your assets to the, their fullest, fullest potential, and that's good stuff. Uh, we did over $2 billion in infrastructure investments all over the state of North Carolina. This is water and sewer, and your government officials will tell you this. Water and sewer is the lifeline of economic development. You don't have water and sewer, I'm sorry, you're, you're really not going to have anything. You're not going to have housing developments, uh, you're not going to have businesses. So water and sewer is a lifeline. But all over North Carolina, we have systems that are dated. We have systems that are being run uh, many times by very small municipalities. Uh, I have one in my district, they have less than 400 people. Um, and their system has lines that have not been updated in decades um, because they just don't have the capacity. So our members sent us um, projects that came from recommendations from your local officials from all over the state to do infrastructure improvements in water and sewer all over the state. We are seeing growth out of the urban areas where they are moving into these rural communities that are in that type of situation like the town of Rhonda where they do not have the water capacity to even um, build a subdivision. So uh, those investments I think will pay dividends that we really can't even measure uh, in the next 10 year period and we hope to continue to do that and I know that many of those projects impacted not only Mount Airy but it impacted the other municipalities and water systems here in uh, Surrey County. And I want to talk a little bit about workforce development because I've just got a few more minutes. We were marked quite uh, high by CNBC for workforce, but as I've been traveling the state, the biggest concern that employers have is workforce. Uh, folks are having problems finding employees, they're having problems retaining employees, and then when they get the employee, they really do not have a skill set and they're having to train internal, and by the time that they get the training done, the person leaves for another job. So it's this vicious cycle and workforce development is tricky because technology is moving so fast that by the time you train someone on whatever the technology is, 
and you get the program set up and the program is linked with the community college and the community cl college classes are happening and you've got all of that set up, you're talking about two years later. Well, as fast as technology is moving, the technology that they're being trained on is dated by that point. So somehow in the education system, we've got to close that gap. Um, uh, here, you do a good job, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Shockley, uh, with Surrey Community, with his program that he has, and I forgot the proper term because there's so many uh, programs. Is it um, Surrey Yak and Works? Is extremely innovative. Uh, the program that we started at Northern Regional where it's the partnership between bringing the nurses into the classroom because that was the biggest problem we were having is you couldn't hire nurses to teach the classes because you couldn't pay them enough because they could make so much more money. Creating that partnership is creating a pipeline that's very clear for the hospital. These type innovative workforce development programs, you guys are actually on the cutting edge of it and the success of those programs are going to end up being modeled all over the state because we're looking at ways to close this workforce gap because what we're doing now it's we can't move it fast enough to match the education system to the workforce demands and just kind of crystal balling for you I think in the future what you're going to see with education is that folks are wanting skills and when I say that, I'm not saying this is just plumbing and bricklaying. I'm not, that's part of it. The demands in that sector is huge. But we have demands for biochemists now and RTP. We have demands for um, any advanced level degree imaginable uh, in the state. So we have workforce needs from the bricklayer all the way up to a physician in rural North Carolina to the biochemist that is doing um, uh, virus research in RTP because that's the different economic sectors that we have. So moving forward with our education, we're, we're going to have to develop those skills. Uh, the idea of kind of school for school's sake is kind of dying out and you don't necessarily have to have a four-year degree either to find success in these sectors. It's a specific skill set for the company. Also, other things that I think we need to look at is how can we encourage companies to teach their own? So we help you with your training because many times these are proprietary. They don't necessarily want the other companies to know exactly how they do the process or exactly how they do the particular uh, widget that they make. So how do we encourage as the government to say, hey, we would love for you to train internal and that internal training also helps with retention. So that's kind of my crystal ball on the direction education is taking. I had a discussion before I be quiet about um, AI this morning and my stepdaughter is graduating from Carolina and she, has, uh, she will have a communications degree and I forgot the proper term they use but basically it's a uh, training her for social media to go into a company and handle their media relations. So a lot of uh, video development, a lot of writing, and that's the skill that she's been trained in. But with AI, as fast as the technology is moving, is her job going to be obsolete in a five-year period uh, because all of the stuff on your social media outlets will be generated by a computer. Um, so we've got to really rethink uh, how we're approaching the skills for our kids. But great things here in Mount Airy. I appreciate the few minutes to share uh, about what we've done in North Carolina and a little bit about the good things that you're doing here. I'm proud of you. Uh, one thing that I think, too, that I want to make a point on before I quit, and um, I guess this is a message to uh, local leaders because I was a town commissioner. We really need to think in the northwest corner as regionally as possible meaning what's good for Mount Airy is good for North Wilkesboro. What's good for North Wilkesboro is good for Boone. It's good for Sparta. It, it truly is because we do not have the economy of scale of a Wake County. We do not have the economy of scale of even a Union County. But together, when we're working on things, it can make all of us rise. We can all move up, just like this speedway. This speedway was not just good for North Wilkesboro. It was good for Mount Airy, it was good for Yakinville, it was good for Winston. And I think if we think in those terms as communities in the Northwest Corner, uh, we will be very successful. 
and um, I, I know the jurisdiction stuff. Uh, North Wilkesboro and Wilkesboro, I don't know. It's the place that's divided by the river, and they used to say the Democrats lived on one side and the Republicans lived on the other. But then when I was elected to North Wilkesboro, the Republicans took over the board. It, you know, it's like my twin sons. And the, they fight all the time. But, oh, gosh, if you mess with them together, they'll fight you back like a circle saw. I, I know that's fun, and that's kind of our culture because we are foothill mountain people, you know. I mean, we're pr proud of our communities. But the stakes are so high now as this economy keeps on changing, and I think we're on the potential of just going off a cliff. Us working together as much as we possibly can will benefit us all. But I appreciate the few minutes to share. I appreciate the wonderful introduction, Chris. I'm going to start hauling you around <laughs> uh, different places. <clears throat> If that's all right with you and, and I appreciate the um, Mount Airy Chamber inviting me uh, to s share a little bit with you thank you